which is brand new, just published. And it will be a pleasure to hear about his development and his future projects as well. So Harry, the stage is yours. So thank you all for coming today. It's very nice to have an audience when I'm talking. <laughs> thank you. So um, I'm going to um, explain uh, to people who are already convinced that steel is a really important material, okay? Because the majority of people in the world ah, okay. The majority of people in the world think that you know steel is steel. There's nothing more interesting. So they will see a, a piece of steel and they will recognize it as a lump of material and another piece of steel is the same as a lump of material but we know that uh, you know we can produce a huge range of properties and that is the reason why steel is so successful you know it is the second most used material in the world so do you know what the first most used material is Concrete, yeah, 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 uh, and of course, concrete contains steel. As well. <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, and um, it is far more interesting than just a homogeneous lump of material. So here you're looking at the atoms inside iron, and each dot is a single atom of iron. This is taken using uh, what's known as a field iron microscope. And the thing to notice about it is that there is a pattern right? A pattern of atoms. It's not just a random collection of atoms. And these patterns define the meaning of a crystal. So a crystal contains a pattern of atoms which you repeat indefinitely over a long range. Okay? Now, these are crystals of pure iron brought back from the moon okay, during the Apollo missions. And they are very interesting because, look, the faces have five edges. And the number five is not a good number for symmetry. You know, you can't, for example, uh, have a five-sided object and you put five-sided objects next to each other and fill all space. That's not possible. So this worried me for a long time. Uh, these pictures are more than uh, 50 years old. And recently we examined the problem and we solved why these are five-sided faces. And uh, the work is published uh, uh, just very recently. Now, this work has no consequence at all on life as we know it. It's just interesting, <laughs> okay? So, so sometimes uh, we do things which are bothering us. You know, why does this crystal have five-sided faces? Uh, these uh, crystals of iron happen naturally on the moon because there's nothing to corrode them, for example. Okay? So if you take a magnet on the moon, uh, you can actually harvest uh, something like 100 tons per 100,000 tons of material just using a magnet on the moon. And one day maybe, maybe we'll be able to extract that iron without any CO2. Okay. <laughs> So, so we should propose that as a project, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so uh, basically the meaning of a crystal is that you have a periodic array of atoms. So if I, if I just define a cell like that, that completely defines all the other atoms that we have in our crystal, because I can just repeat that unit cell indefinitely. So in order to know the position of all the atoms, I just need to define a single cell containing a few atoms. On the other hand, if you look at uh, a random arrangement of atoms, for example, in window glass, then you, ha you have to know the position of every single atom in order to explain the properties of the material. And that, of course, is very, very difficult because you have a very large number of atoms even in a small piece of glass. So crystals are actually very much easier than amorphous materials like glass to handle. Now, uh, because I'm in Udine, I 
did some research. Okay, and this is the construction of the library of Udine uh, University, the Bibliotheca. And uh, of course, uh, you know, the load bearing structure, if you look at the architect's website, is made from steel. And the reason why I'm interested in this will become clear later on. But look, um, I did a search on the university catalog and I found my book there. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, um, Now, uh, this is a, a movie for, uh, provided by the architects on the construction of the building. And you can see there are huge chunks of iron. Okay. And my, I'm concerned with this because do we need to use this much steel? And I also want you to notice uh, all the joints between the beams. You know, uh, for making the joints, you use extra steel. So I tried to search on the web for what kind of steel is being used here, and I could not find it. So this morning, I posed a question to the students who attended, you know, what is the, go, go and ask the architects, you know, what is the steel used for this building and what is its strength and email me. Okay. And I already have an answer. I already have an answer. So the steel is uh, really quite ordinary steel uh, with a strength of the order of uh, 250 to 300 megapascals. And the reason why I'm interested in this will become clear later on in the talk. Okay. So uh, the way in which uh, we can change the pattern in which the atoms are arranged uh, there are many different ways because, you know, in order to control the structure, we alter the types of crystals there are in steels. And one way is to deform the pattern. And in that method, you never actually break any bonds or change the sequence of atoms. And that sometimes we call it martensite, martensitic transformation. But you notice that I can change the pattern and I can change it back. Okay. So, so you can reverse that transformation without any change in the order of the atoms. And that uh, is very interesting because it gives rise to an effect known as a shape memory effect. And I'll illustrate that effect here. This is not actually steel. This is nickel titanium alloy. And, uh, you know, it changes its shape as you change the temperature. Uh, so that's a hot plate. And you can see there's no engineering inside that lump of nickel titanium. It's just nickel titanium, all right? And then when you cool it again, it go reverts to its original shape. So it retains a memory of its original shape. So you can see it reverses its shape. And that's because when we change the pattern in which the atoms are arranged, we are not breaking the bonds. We are maintaining the same sequence of atoms. So why am I saying this? I want you to tell me what are the applications of shape memory alloys. Do you know what this movie and picture are showing? So that is uh, inside the blood of a human being. Okay. And, uh, you know, as, uh, as I get older, I have to worry because uh, some of those arteries might get clogged up with uh, things that shouldn't be there. So you restrict the volume of blood that can flow. So what you do is you put this shape memory element in a compressed form inside the artery and make it expand okay? without any surgery at all. You know, you insert it in position and expand it and therefore you solve the problem. Okay? So that's one important application of the nickel titanium shape memory alloy. But I'm now going to show you a major application, which is on a much bigger scale of an iron-based shape memory alloy, right? So this is a, a bridge, uh, which is in the Czech Republic, uh, or originally it was called the Czech Republic, but now this is its new name. And uh, the location of this bridge is somewhere between Ostrava and Prague. 
And this bridge is uh, 113 years old, right? And when it was made, of course, it wasn't designed for, you know, lorries going over it and so forth. And during the course of time, um, it has uh, corroded quite significantly, you can see here. And that means that you're losing uh, the load supporting section. Now, just like uh, in the region around Udine, you know, there are things which are centuries and centuries old, but people like them, you know, uh, so you preserve them and you do a lot of work to make sure that, you know, the mosaics from the Roman times are still uh, very nicely there. Similarly, you don't like to lose a bridge which was made 113 years old, but you can't actually go and put, uh, you know, modern technology on it because that would ruin it, right? So you've got to uh, make it uh, uh, recover its load bearing capacity without actually changing its uh, appearance above the bridge. Uh, so how do you do that? Well, this is the original material that's used and uh, you know it's a very low carbon steel, you can see here. These are just ferrite grains and the strength is really quite small, you know, 200-ish uh, megapascals. So what we need to do is to put a compressive stress on the beams, right? So how do you do that? Well, this is a, an iron-based shape memory alloy, which you can manufacture on a large scale, right? You can buy it. And you first strain it by 2.5%, a plastic strain. You then anchor it to the bridge, and then you activate the reverse uh, effect so that it contracts again by the shape memory effect, and therefore it puts a compressive stress on the beam. And this is exactly what has been done, right? So this is the shape memory element being placed in location, and uh, then you put the ceramic heating blankets to get it to 260 degrees centigrade and therefore it will reverse the transformation, right? And in this case, the transformation is from uh, austenite, which is face-centered cubic, to hexagonal closed-backed uh, epsilon martensite. But this is a real civil engineering application, which puts a compressive stress on the beam, and, you know, the bridge is able to perform, okay? And uh, now this idea is being applied to other similar situations. Okay, this is uh, an aircraft engine, um, and the shaft here is made from steel. Okay, and one part of the engine is really hot, more than a thousand degrees centigrade. Okay, and the other part is really, uh, you know, it can get to minus fifty degrees centigrade if, when you're up at altitude. So the steel has to be able to support both those conditions, and there, until recently, there was no steel able to do that, all right? So if I go back uh, a slide, just to show you the movie, what used to be done is you take two different kinds of steels, one for high temperature, low temperature, and then you join them up. But remember, the shaft is about this diameter, right? solid shaft. Uh, so join them by friction welding, and that movie shows the friction welding. It's, it's a really um, impressive process, but you really don't want to do this, okay? So we wanted to find a single shaft solution, which uh, copes with both high temperatures and low temperatures. Okay. So here is uh, some of the work that Steve did, um, where we engineered very small, precipitates, which are not carbides, right? They are intermetallic compounds. So the green phase here, 20 nanometer scale, uh, is a nickel aluminum compound. And the black phase is a combination of iron, chromium, and molybdenum, what we normally call Laves phase. And Laves phase has a bad reputation, but if it's small enough, it doesn't. OK, so we created this material and uh, of course, uh, you know, before you put it into an engine, there's a huge amount of testing because uh, one of the very severe tests is that, you know, if this blade breaks, okay, 
that is a massive blade with a huge momentum. Then the engine goes into violent vibration. So the shaft has to bend classically to correct for that vibration. And then you can shut the engine down, okay? Because an aircraft can fly on one engine, really. Okay? Although we have two or more engines, it can fly on one engine. So the requirements for a shaft for an aircraft engine are very, very severe. So a huge amount of testing is done before you put it into service. And we have obtained patents for this technology. So this is a granted patent. The term B2 over here means it's actually a granted patent, all right? And it relies on these intermetallic compounds of the Laves phase, which is the iron, molybdenum, chromium phase, and um, beta, and huge number, amount of testing the strength is of the order of two gigapascals, ductility and fatigue strength and creep strength, et cetera, et cetera, have been measured by Rolls-Royce. And this is a second patent granted where we uh, introduced a second variant where we can control the austenite grain size. Okay, so here is the real material and you can see the scale here, massive objects, uh, but actually the, uh, the density here of 7.8-ish is less than of the other components like nickel inside the engine. So it doesn't matter. And these are blanks, you know, they are not in the final state. In the final state, there is really complicated machining and various other things. And your alloy must be able to be engineered into that state, okay? So it takes uh, a huge amount of money to actually get something into practice. So this is now uh, uh, in civil engines, uh, civil aircraft engine shafts, which is civil engines are really big, yeah? Okay, now, Fabio Miani, many, many years ago, uh, maybe 25 years ago, uh, decided, hmm? Okay, let's say 30 years ago, okay? <laughs> Uh, he decided that, look, uh, why don't we create objects by building them up layer by layer? Okay, so you print a shape and then you print another shape on it and, and so on. And that way, in that way, you can engineer really things which you couldn't create by machining. So, for example, think of a chess piece, a castle. You could actually make that castle with staircases and doors and windows inside using 3D, what is now known as 3D printing, okay? So uh, there are many methods of doing this. Uh, this is uh, using a laser and powder. And for large objects, we just use the normal welding technology. You know, so you have a weld deposit going back and forth and building it up according to a, a computer program that controls the robot. Uh, now, Depending on what you want to do, you choose this or this, and that's the sort of productivity that you get from the process. Now, this is a dye that is used commonly in the car manufacturing industry for stamping out dual phase steels and steel trip assisted steels for car uh, chassis and also for the body. And with 3D printing, you see, this is a machined, machined die. With 3D printing, you can actually design the die to do the job that you want using 70% less steel. 70% okay? less steel. And the shape of the object will look completely different, but it's doing exactly the same function. So here is the die manufactured by 3D printing, which is using 70% less this is an expensive steel, all right? It's a maraging steel. So it's using 70% less steel, and you have optimized the design of the die because this is easy to manufacture using 3D printing, but you couldn't, it would be much more expensive if you use normal machining methods. Okay. So 70% less steel. Okay. And these are, uh, this is the reason why I put in the Udin uh, library the bibliotheca, okay? Um, so these are the normal ways in which you join beams coming from different directions. And they use a lot more steel 
than is necessary. And not only that, but uh, you cut out the same section and you may not need the weight over here, for example, to support the stress. On the other hand, this is a 3D manufactured, uh, 3D printed node or beams, right, join up. And you're only using the steel where it's needed to support the load. Okay? So it is 50% less in weight and it looks very nice. Okay? Uh, you know, you would enjoy looking at this kind of a joint compared with this, I think. All right, it depends on your taste as well, right? Uh, okay, now, 3D printing is not the answer for everything. Okay? You, you should only use it when there is a significant advantage. Now, this is just a, a, a printed object for research purposes, all right? Uh, can you see a problem? Any ideas? Hmm? Surface finish is one thing. Uh, okay. uh, I mean, you know, it's not it's nowhere near near net shape if you are trying to make something. Hmm? Uh, layers, uh, I'll come to that uh, the microstructure, but I want to to spot a much bigger problem. Yeah, so so the base has become distorted, severely distorted, right? Because that's uh, uh, the process of depositing layer by layer causes distortion. Because first you put a hot layer, it contracts. Okay, then you put another layer on top, and so on. So you get huge, uh, huge amount of distortion, and this is a big problem in three D printing. Okay, and uh, of course uh, this is visible distortion, but you will have residual stresses in the constrained areas. Okay, so you need to be, you need to worry about those. And secondly, you know, what you said, the structure here, the grains simply grow in one direction across the layers, which means that you have a strong anisotropy. The properties are going to be different in different directions. And sometimes uh, you get lots of impurities because after all you're depositing layer by layer and there's no further processing that you do. Okay? Uh, this is uh, simply showing, uh, this is a diagram where you would have a uniform color if we didn't have the anisotropy. But look, because of the intense anisotropy, the colors are only there. Okay? So these are problems that you need to worry about depending on what application you're going to make of it, and you should only use 3D printing where you can't make a product by another method. Okay. Now, this is uh, uh, for bearing applications, uh, and it's a, it's a method where you want to test out an alloy that you have never used before. And I'll tell you why it is only for testing and not for production. Okay, so first you deposit uh, this cylinder, so there's no drilling involved. Okay, you make this by 3D printing. Uh, you can make the surface smooth before the next part of the process. And then you ring roll. So these two objects are moving at different speeds, and therefore this becomes a ring here. And then you can do your experiments on a new alloy. The reason why I'm saying it's not suitable for mass production is because this is a very slow process. Uh, this is about 40 times longer than taking a bar and drilling it out and then using it. Okay, so additive manufacturing is not a product, a high productivity process, but it's outstanding if you just want to try something out. Okay, because to make a large amount of material and then cut it up and drill holes with a new alloy is expensive. Okay, now, um, you mentioned uh, surface, surface finish on additive manufacturing. So there's no additive manufactured product which doesn't need some work afterwards, even though the people will say it's near net shape. Okay? But 
we have been making near nut shaped steel for a very long time. So there, where there is zero waste. So for example, these rails are actually rolled into that shape, okay? There is, uh, you start with, uh, you know, a square, a uh, big chunk of steel. And without any machining, create the shapes that you use as rails. Zero waste. There is completely true near net shape processing. But most people in 3D printing don't know about this, okay? So you should remind them that, look, we've been doing this for, you know, 100 years, okay, <laughs> by rolling deformation. And I think in your mill, you also start with, you know, a large object and then uh, bend it into an oval and then final. Now, uh, this is a movie that I took uh, in uh, Moscow. Okay, so I was on the 60th floor of a restaurant and I put my camera on my dining table and filmed it. Now, I don't know why it's not playing. Ah, yeah. It was a very bad weather day with lots of wind, okay, and um, rain. So steel beams will deflect because if, you, if it's long, even though it's a very small strain, it adds up. Okay? So the building swings. And if you had 101 floors, then the swing would be about one meter at the top. Okay, so on the top floor, you would not feel well. Okay, <laughs> so, uh, so this is a Type A 101, uh, which was, at, when it was built, it was the tallest building in the world. And I was very happy to be in there while it was being constructed, okay, because some of my former students were engineers involved in this. And uh, here is me with my former students, okay. <laughs> Uh, during the construction stage. So the way in which they solve this problem is you put a ball of steel weighing 900 tons, you suspend it from the 92nd floor to the 87th floor. So it's a tuned damper. Okay, So it damps out the vibrations, right? And of course, it's not just the ball, but also the ropes that support the ball are from your wire rods. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, so um, this is during construction, and this is the largest additively manufactured object in the world, because you cut out circular plates, and then you join them up by welds, and you create your sphere. And you know this has become a huge tourist attraction because they've painted it golden, okay. <laughs> just like the statue uh, on in the square. And uh, people can uh, observe this. And during a big earthquake, you know, this actually is recorded to damp the vibrations. So this is the largest additively manufactured object in the world, but by a different technology. You know, cut out circular discs and you weld them together. And uh, the wires themselves are about two gigapascals in strength because it's uh, drawn perlite and so forth. Okay, so going back to this, uh, you know, uh, the reason why I wanted to know the properties of this steel is because I think we can do better. We can, we can cut the amount of steel that was used, not just by modifying the nodes. And I'll give you a case study. So, we are the ones who are causing the CO2 pollution, not the production of steel. It's because we use too much steel, okay? Uh, so, um, blast furnace, this is a glass object, <laughs> just a decorative blast furnace, all right? But I thought that would be interesting because you haven't seen that before. And you are producing uh, not carbon, uh, carbon dioxide, not just by breathing, but by using uh, goods, all right, and steel helps to improve the quality of life by orders of magnitude. You know, you wouldn't have any of the comforts of modern life without that. So we've got to solve the problem without influencing the quality of life or the performance of industry. And I have a method, okay, which is 
All of this is in my book as well. Okay. So I'm going to tell you how to solve the problem in a matter of four years, right? Uh, without doing any research and development. Now, uh, if instead of using the sort of steel that's used in the bibliotheca, you use already available microalloy steel, then it, because it is uh, stronger and tougher, you can reduce the size of the beams. Okay, so you compare the ordinary steel that's used in construction, and construction takes up fifty percent of all steel. Okay, and uh, this is the microalloy steel, and you would reduce the weight uh, from one hundred to seventy-eight. And of course, microalloy steel is more expensive. Okay, um, you can see that here. But because you use 22% less steel, the total cost is actually smaller. And unfortunately, you know, design codes, et cetera, specify the steel that you should use. And architects are not going to deviate from design codes. Okay. So, uh, so the solution, uh, first I'll show you the building actually. Uh, I've been to this building and it's in Brazil and it's uh, fully constructed and working perfectly fine. So um, this uh, is another, uh, I'll, I'll come back to the story of the building. Uh, this is uh, in the region around the seas around Indonesia. Fishing was done by putting dynamite into the sea and the fish would rise as dead fish. But in the process, you destroy coral. Okay, I, I mean, this is a real picture taken uh, about uh, 20 years ago. Steel has a big contribution here okay, to completely regenerate these coral reefs. And the reason is its density, okay? because you make these objects, okay? And you put them on the seabed together with uh, bits of living coral. And they will stay there, even if there is a storm, because it digs into the seabed. And that is important, yeah? Because, uh, you know, if the coral is shoved about, then it won't grow, okay? And I'll show you the result 20 years later. This is the same region, and here you can see the remnants of the steel. But look at it, you know. And I've got many more pictures uh, like this from the Ocean Agency. I have their permission to use all those pictures. So with the help of steel, very simple idea. All these coral reefs have been regenerated because dynamite fishing is no longer allowed. Now, um, we can make, routinely make steel, which is uh, two gigapascal strong. But what is impressive here is that we can maintain the strength and ductility at cryogenic temperatures. Okay? That means, uh, you know, at liquid oxygen and liquid methane temperatures. So if I ask you a question, what is a rocket that goes to the moon made of? Yeah, 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 you're not allowed to speak. That's right. Okay. Any ideas? Well, it's aluminum lithium alloys. You know, they're, they're light and uh, therefore you think you can make a rocket from them, right? So uh, all the Apollo missions, etc., are aluminum lithium alloys for the rockets. But with this, you can actually make them out of steel. And this is the largest rocket ever built, right? And this is uh, this is the spaceship part, which is stainless steel, and this is the booster part, which also is stainless steel. And uh, of course, it has been launched and tested, okay? And it's only three millimeters thick. So what we need to think about is not just the strength, because this is two gigapascal strength, but if you divide by the density, it beats aluminum lithium alloys strength to density. Not only that, it is far more easier to construct. So here is how you join up the cylindrical sections. 
and simply run a laser, routinely available lasers around to make the welds. So this is the largest rocket ever launched. Now, the ultimate idea is go to Mars. And the atmosphere in Mars is much thinner than on Earth. And that means the rocket must go at a glancing angle and it heats up a lot more. And aluminum simply wouldn't survive. Okay? So steel would. Uh, of course, we are not uh, initially going to Mars. Okay. Um, so this Char Charlie Cuman actually uh, has been a friend of mine for a lot longer than he was at uh, SpaceX or Tesla. Uh, he was at uh, Northwestern University in Chicago, and uh, I have spent a lot of time over there. And he was the outstanding metallurgist. Yeah. And he was first hired by Apple and then by uh, Tesla in, uh, no, not by Tesla, but by SpaceX. And he created this concept. And then uh, Elon Musk was so impressed with him. He, he made him the head of materials for Tesla and SpaceX and said to him, look, your job is to look at every material that we use and see if we can do better by this kind of thinking. Okay? And I'll, I have other examples which uh, made a huge difference, but I want to continue on this story. This steel is two gigapascals in strength very, very strong, and it has ductility, okay? So, uh, Charlie Cuman decided that, look, we can make a truck out of this, okay? And this is the so-called cyber truck, which is supposed to look uh, sexy, but it also has very good aerodynamics, and also aer it uh, there are two aspects of aerodynamics. One is going through uh, against the air, and the other is you don't want to lift off. So on both counts, it works very well. But why is it this shape? Is it because he thought this is a really interesting shape? Most people think that is the case. But the real story is that, you know, if you have sheet, which is three millimeters thick and two gigapascals strong, you cannot form it into the sort of curves, yeah, that you have in normal cars. You can bend it, all right? And that is the reason for this shape. But nobody knows, uh, I mean, they don't publicize that fact, okay? Uh, now, the advantage uh, also is that you don't need any forming presses. The bending equipment is much, much easier. Yeah. So this costs $100,000, okay? <laughs> and people buy it, okay? <laughs> Now, in the case of uh, ships which carry oil, the last thing you want is, uh, you know, the oil tanks uh, being fractured by a collision. So um, to minimize that, you sometimes put more tanks. So if some tanks are broken, not oil, everything is lost. But that means you are using more steel. Okay. And the other solution is that you use a double-hulled ship. But again, you are using more steel. So Nippon steel has developed uh, a steel which is so ductile, right? Uh, and can be welded and all the components that go with ships that you don't need a double hull. And um, its structure is, looks ordinary, okay? But it's a mixture of uh, perlite and uh, bainite in, the, in these regions, not just perlite, okay? And I have actually seen full scale tests where the impact with a very large impactor so that it doesn't rupture. And now it is validated by insurance companies, by the standards and so on. And of course, Nippon Steel is a very big company, so they can actually, they know how to get things validated in standards and so forth. Okay? And it, of course, we are using much less steel. Uh, so these are the sort of properties. So here is the way we can reduce steel consumption by 25% in four years without causing any pain to the quality of life or to industry. So you tax everything according to the steel content, whether it's imported or exported or, or made locally. 
And that means that you will think much more carefully about design and which steel you should use. And all the better steels are already available. Okay? And then you give that tax money to your local companies so that they can improve their technology towards uh, environmental issues. Now, tax is a dirty word, right? But all of you are going to pay double the cost for buying a car very soon. You realize that? You know, you buy your fossil fuel car, you buy the equivalent electric car, it's double the cost. And nobody is complaining about that. Uh, maybe the time hasn't come to complain, but we won't be manufacturing fossil fuel cars uh, by 2035. Okay? And um, therefore, you will be paying twice as much for a car. There's no way of realistically lowering the price of an electric car unless, uh, unless you go for this Citroen, which travels at 28 miles an hour, okay? And uh, you can only use it for about 30 miles. And that only costs uh, 8,000 8, euros, all right? Uh, but uh, it wouldn't be safe either. Because it's, uh, you know, if you have a crash with a bigger object, <laughs> then you're in trouble. So this is the way to reduce the consumption of steel quickly by 25%. And all the research programs, all right, and today we heard from the European Union and so forth, are not going to solve the problem in the time scale that we need to solve the problem. Okay, we are already one and a half degrees, uh, we are past the one and a half degree marker or 1.48 <laughs> degree marker. So that is uh, the case that I've made in, in the book as well. And I've also given an interview to the BBC uh, for half an hour on this subject. And I've presented at uh, a joint meeting of the Chinese Academy of Sciences and the Royal Society in London. And nobody has uh, been able to counter the argument that research in this area will not solve the problem in the time that is needed nor have they argued against what I'm proposing, okay? So that I think is the, oh, sorry, one more thing if you have time. So you will hear a lot of nonsense about steels because steel is the gold standard against which all new materials are compared, right? And uh, there have been huge nonsensical stories about graphene for many years. And if you use, uh, for example, chat GTP or something like that, uh, because it's based on information on the web, it will tell you that graphene is 200 times stronger than steel. And that is complete nonsense, okay? And I'll prove it to you. And I've written papers about this and also in the book and, and various other places. So just to give you an idea, uh, uh, so the graphene people invited me to give a keynote talk in 2019. So these figures are from 2019 because they knew that I was uh, saying things about graphene which they didn't like. But I gave them the facts, you know. I said, look, uh, the number of publications in graphene are 1.46 million and in steel we beat you, okay? Uh, the number of scientists is also bigger in steels. And the annual production, <laughs> okay? In those days, it was 1.6 billion. Now it's 2.2 billion, okay? And all of the steel we produce is used, whereas actually there is no structural application at all, zero of graphene, okay? Now, the reason is very simple. And if they were good scientists, they would have known of why you can't use graphene or carbon nanotubes for structural applications. And the reason, uh, you can go back to 1956, uh, and this, this was already in the earlier editions of my book, okay? Uh, so if you plot the strength versus size uh, of iron, okay, very small to significant size, the strength collapses. Uh, I mean, it collapses to the values that we are used to. 
And the reason is very clear that the probability of finding a defect becomes larger as your object becomes larger. And I'll explain why that is the case. So if you rely on strength for perfection, then it, you cannot scale up the object. It's impossible. Okay? And I'll tell you why it's impossible, thermodynamically impossible. Uh, so the maximum strength, uh, uh, measured strength, okay, of steel is uh, 14 and a half gigapascals when it is about two micrometers in size. So if I take the claimed strength of graphene as 130 gigapascals, divide by that, it's only nine times stronger than steel when it is very small, okay? And that is the other thing that you need to specify. You can say, okay, graphene is nine times stronger than steel, but only when it is very small. And a child could have worked this out, right? But if you even now, if you go to the website of Manchester University, you'll find statements saying it's 200 times stronger than steel, even though they know that I've published papers on this, okay? So, so never join Manchester University, okay? Now, the reason is very simple. Uh, Supposing that there is a cost to creating a, a defect, right? And this, you know, a defect has a higher energy than uh, not having a defect. So that opposes the formation of a defect. But if you put a defect in, it also increases the number of arrangements that you can make of the atoms by, by uh, this, uh, this factor here. Uh, and therefore, that favors because that increases entropy and entropy favors the formation of defects. So you have a balance, and the number of defects divided by the total, total number of atoms that you have is given by this simple equation. And there is nothing you can do. This is thermodynamics. There's no manufacturing method that you can use to get rid of these defects, okay? Full stop. So, uh, you know, at equilibrium, there will be so many defects in a nanotube or graphene that uh, And the other really interesting point that is completely ignored is that with a metal, you know, the atoms can slide over each other without changing the bond. The metallic bond is like an electron gas that permeates between the atoms. So layers of atoms can slide over each other without at all affecting the bond. With carbon-carbon bonds, you break them, that's it. Okay? So the deformation is entirely elastic. So if you load that to 130 gigapascals, then the energy stored in there is 10 times more than dynamite. Okay? So if it breaks, you will have an explosion. So that would not be a safe engineering material because all the energy is reversible. It's just elastic. When we talk about toughness, we want the material to absorb energy. Again, okay? plastic deformation, when the layers of atoms slide over each other, absorbs energy. So this is how the strength of graphene almost vanishes as you make it to a visible size. Okay. Right, so um, this is a question I'm going to leave you with because you have to read the book to find the answer. But it is absolutely true that I can show you something that is 10 billion times stronger than steel. Not only that, but it is 10 times more ductile and you can make it large. But to find the answer, the answer is yes. You have to look in the book, all right? So that is my sales pitch for the book, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and I think that's the uh, end of the uh, talk. Uh, th this is just to show you the contents. Uh, uh, there's a lot more than I have uh, I have talked about, you know, because all the fundamentals must also be understood. Okay, so I'll be very happy to answer questions.
Yeah, 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 yeah. Every time you want to underline that we are not in, in, in connection, so. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> but you know, you know that I'm I'm more involving megawatt power, not some kilowatt or just less some watts. No? <laughs> Yes. Yes, it is a completely different scale. Of forty years. Now, what what is uh, I would say the trend of today is, of course, to push a lot on the size because there is the, sub the idea to substitute the blast furnaces with something more brackets clean. So the DRI technology together with the electric arc furnace is uh, quite interesting and uh, we are seeing a very huge trend in the substitution of this technology with uh, the direct reduction plants joint with the electric arc furnaces and uh, the size just to give you an idea is speak about furnaces of 200 and 200 250 megawatt power with uh, 250 300 ton of capping capacity then if we go back to small sizes so the pico mill or <laughs> much less the uh, it is clear that is most uh, related to the products that we can we can do. So it, it is difficult to answer to, to the question: What is the limit between uh, the university and the, the lab uh, experience and then the production? But I guess we can have some uh, some uh, one two. One ton per per day should be for its size, I guess. We 
profitability, yes, with with pay, with payback of seven, ten years for the investment. Yes, a high, lum high aluminium, high copper, for example. Yes. Yes, yes. yes. I was okay. in that project. Okay. 86. <laughs> yes. oh, it is not. But I, I want to add just a remark. No? For example, say that to do to do experiments on industrial scale. Remember that that the, the, the steel makers are quite conservative. They do not want to be pioneers. They want to be the second or maybe the third. After, <laughs> <laughs> is it is it true? <laughs> Every every hour are two hundred thousand euros, so it is better not to make too much experiments. <laughs> okay. I I think so. yes. It, we we spoke also some some yes. couple of years ago. Yes, of course. Not, but we can think about that. No?
the real the real problem is that so all the pyrometallurgy is too hot, too much temperature. So with the 1,650 degrees, what can you do with the sensors? So simulation is simulation, of course. No, you you can you can get, it. but to have Galileo method to make the <laughs> validation, so at that temperature is quite complex. At least a twenty five percent more. I do care about also fogging, you know, plastic things, many, many things. I was very worried about. Adding something for, for then you don't help other uh, proper casting and other. So there is a wealth of try to have some scientific based information, even for process modeling and for property models. <laughs> Somebody said, yeah. But remember, there should be something in between. It would be important. Point yeah. if uh, the, uh, the European community is giving out quite a lot of money, even see very significant. There must be some purpose that they are thinking about. They are really believing, and I think now is the time, still for still greening for still uh, uh, like that. Okay. 
So, Harry, fantastic to have you here. Yes. Ha, 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 ha.